Hi, everyone. Welcome to our monthly talk. This is for the month of June, and we're going to be talking about sleep from an Ayurvedic perspective and then some really interesting, and I always say, I only speak for myself when I say interesting, but some really interesting scientific information um, about our hormones and how we actually respond um, to sunlight and how that helps us sleep. So we'll be talking about our circadian rhythms today and some of the things that um, Ayurveda teaches us along those lines of keeping ourselves in alignment with the rhythms of nature and specifically the sun. So again, I think this topic is in incredibly interesting. So if you guys have questions and you weren't able to attend this talk live, please feel free to ask questions in our Facebook group. Okay. So let's dig into this. I want to preface by saying that a lot of this information is from someone named Andrew Huberman, and I've put his name and his website um, in the chat box. It's hubermanlab.com. So if you can't see the chat box, I'm not sure if it's going to be in the recording or not, but it's H-U-B-E-R, Huberman, M-A-N, lab, lab.com, hubermanlab.com. And he has got so many podcasts with um, scientific um, information and studies that he is sharing. And then also he has experts come in. And this was a podcast that he was on. Um, and he talks about all kinds of things. But one of the main things that I gleaned from this like five hour long podcast was one of the main things we want to do to improve our sleep. So I thought you guys would really appreciate this topic, but check out his website. If you want to listen to other podcasts, he's great because he always lists the studies, the scientific studies that support the research that he's sharing, which I really appreciate. So, all right, let's jump into this. So sleep, it can be so rewarding and so elusive for, for so many of us. And Ayurveda tells us that for optimal health, we should align ourselves with the rhythms of nature. We should rise with the sun, peak with the sun in our activity levels and our meals, having the largest meal of the day in the middle of the day, being our most active around those times, and then gradually set with the sun as the day ends, slowing down until we stop and we sleep and we reset for the next day. And science backs this up in our understanding of hormones and circadian rhythms, which are our biological clocks. We have natural mechanisms that we can, we can actually influence in place to keep us aligned with these natural rhythms. And when we fall out of alignment with these rhythms, we encourage imbalance and ultimately disease. When we don't get enough sleep, as you know, Everything from our digestion, immune system, ability to focus, that brain fog, and our metabolisms become affected almost immediately. You know, one night of bad sleep is, is pretty easy to recover from, but if this is happening more than about, let's say, 20% of the time, acute or chronic disease will soon follow. So we want a good night's sleep 80% of the time. So I want you to think about that. Think about that 80% of the time. And where are you falling in there, right? So are you getting a good night's sleep 80% of the time? Or is it lower than that? Maybe it's more than that, which would be great. Um, but, you know, we want to think about trying to optimize our sleep to fit into that category, right? So 80% of the time we're getting a good night's sleep. So how can we use our knowledge of the rhythms of nature and the rhythms of our bodies to improve our sleep. Well, it's first important to understand how the rhythms work. Every cell in our body has a 24 hour circadian clock regulated by genes. So in effect, we have millions or even trillions of clocks in our bodies that need to be regulated to our time zone. They need to be regulated to the rising and setting of the sun in our particular environment. And that's why everything from digestion to focus to our immune system gets thrown off when we travel or change time zones, right? It all has to reset. Okay, so here's the number one practice we're going to talk about today for better sleep. And you may or may not be surprised to hear this. 
get sunlight in your eyes within one hour of waking. Okay, so that's mainly what we're going to talk about today and all the reasons why this is so important, which again, I find fascinating. So get sunlight in your eyes within an hour of waking. So if you wake up before the sun, which I know some people do, you want to turn on bright lights in your house. And then once the sun is up, you want to get five to 10 minutes of sunlight without sunglasses. So within an hour of waking, or again, if you're waking up well before the sun rises for whatever reason, your practices, your work, your habits, then as soon as the sun rises, you want to get five to 10 minutes of sunlight without sunglasses and contacts and glasses are okay because they focus light into our retina to help us see, right? So even if your contacts, or your glasses have some UV protection, that's okay. And of course, you never want to stare directly at the sun. This is indirect light coming into our eyes, indirect sunlight coming into our eyes. And again, we don't want it filtered through sunglasses, but it's okay if it's contacts or, you know, reading glasses, glasses. So we don't want you running into things out, outdoors. Let's be safe about it. And again, we don't want you staring directly at the sun. Even if it's cloudy outside, you'll get more photons or light energy from the sun than from your indoor or artificial light. Okay, so even if it's cloudy outside and you want to do this when the sun is at a low angle in the sky. So it doesn't have to be sunrise, but it should be, you know, by let's say like 9, 9 a.m. And you wanna do this most days of the week, if not every day. Okay, so most days of the week. So maybe let's think 80% of the time so that we get in that 80% of the time quality sleep that we're looking for, that we're aiming for. So what does this do? This modulates the timing of something called the cortisol pulse, the cortisol pulse. Okay, so what's cortisol? So if you know what cortisol is, this will be a good refresher. Um, and I think we've heard of cortisol, right? It's a stress hormone. It's nature's built-in alarm system. Okay, so it's your body's main stress hormone. It works with certain parts of your brain to control your mood, your motivation, and your fear. <laughs> so lots of things that come up maybe during your workday, mood, motivation, and fear. Your adrenal glands, they sit on top of your kidneys, make cortisol. And cortisol functions to do many things. And among those things, it manages how your body uses carbs, fats, and proteins. It manages your metabolism. It keeps, it actually keeps inflammation down. It regulates your blood pressure. It increases your blood sugar. It controls your sleep and wake cycle. And it boosts your energy so that you can handle stress. And then it helps restore balance afterwards. So it comes up during times of stress. It comes up during times of stress. But stress can be a good thing, right? It can prepare us to flee or fight or freeze, as the case may be. The cortisol prepares us for difficult tasks. And problems arise when we have too much of it or too little of it, you know, or if we're stressed out all the time. But when we're in balance and when our cortisol is in balance, it's a very good thing, okay? So, so back to this cortisol pulse. Once every 24 hours, in accordance with your body's circadian rhythms, right? Those rhythms that follow the sun, you get a big healthy boost of cortisol every 24 hours. And what this boost in cortisol does is it makes your body temperature rise and that's what wakes you up. So cortisol up, body temperature up, wake up, okay? And sometimes you might even wake up before your alarm if you're really in a rhythm. Right, you're really in a rhythm around waking and sleeping, your body's naturally rising in temperature. It knows, right? It's in that cycle. It's in that rhythm. And in contrast, your body temperature dropping is what makes you sleepy. And this is very interesting to me. This drop in body temperature happens exactly 16 hours after the cortisol pulse, the cortisol boost, right? 16 hours later, when you're supposed to get sleepy, 
right? And then you've got eight hours to sleep and it starts all over again. So this cortisol boost sets your body temperature rhythm in motion. It enhances your level of focus. It increases your level of alertness and it stabilizes your mood. So you get that sunlight, that indirect light into your eyes without sunglasses. You know, when the sun is at a low angle in the sky and your cortisol bumps and you wake up, your body temperature rises and you wake up. And then all of these great things happen. All these great things that cortisol does for us that enhances our ability to focus and perceive the task at hand and produce under you know, a, a moderate amount of stress. So you can imagine if you want to have a productive day, whether it's at work or just you know, around your home, with balanced levels of energy, you want this to happen as soon as after waking up as possible, right? We want this to happen pretty, pretty quickly so we can have a, a productive day. So getting the light in your eyes at or around sunrise, or at least let's say by 9 a.m., when the sun is still at that lower angle in the sky, ensures that your body temperature rises to its peak sometime in the afternoon, okay? And that should actually prevent that afternoon slump, which we'll talk about, that happens to some people, or that happens to a lot of people, in fact, in my experience. So getting the sunlight in the eyes then produces the cortisol bump, which then helps to increase our body temperature, which wakes us up. And about um, sometime in the afternoon, that's when we get a, a, the peak in our body temperature. So I think sometime around like two or three, and then it gradually starts to come down over the course of the afternoon. Eventually it will drop even below uh, like one or two degrees below that maximum, that afternoon peak. And that's going to start making you sleepy at the appropriate time or about 16 hours after the cortisol peak, after the cortisol bump. Okay. So body temperature lowers, that's when we get sleepy. And so incidentally, here's another point that will help you sleep better. This is why you want a really cold or cool room for sleep. This is an interesting little tidbit. You dump heat through your palms and the soles of your feet, the palms of your hands and the soles of your feet. So get your room temperature down really low and you can always pile on blankets, right? On top of your body, but you wanna make sure that your hands and your feet could come out of the blanket or out from under to release heat. If you have a cool room, this is easy to do. Just bring your hands and feet out, it'll release body heat. But if you're in a warm room, you can't do that. Your body temperature stays too high to keep you asleep very well. And the optimal temperature for sleep, which I've always thought, wow, really, is 60 to 67 degrees Fahrenheit. 60 to 67 degrees Fahrenheit, which is pretty low, I think, right? Whenever my thermostat and I put my AC that low, I'm like, yikes, especially in the summer, if you're in the South, that's a really high, um, that's a high electricity bill. So um, you, what I would recommend doing is making sure that um, you know what the temperature in your room is. So unless your thermostat is in your room, in your bedroom or where you sleep, then I would invest in a thermometer that, you know, like an outdoor thermometer that you hang and stick it on the wall and see where your temperature actually goes at night when you have your thermostat set, you know, maybe you started at 67 and see if your bedroom actually gets that low or if it gets lower and maybe you don't have to, does that make sense? Maybe you don't have to set your thermostat that low because maybe your bedroom's actually cooler than you think it is, or than your thermostat that's not in your bedroom is telling you. So maybe that's a little consolation. Maybe your bedroom's actually cooler than you think, but you can start cooling it down earlier in the day by drawing shades, turning off lights, maybe um, blowing a fan um, into your bedroom. If the cooler air is outside, it'll kind of bring it into the bedroom. So you can start cooling down your bedroom earlier in the evening to help with energy efficiency. Um, but you want your, your sleep temp, your room temp to be 60 to 67 degrees Fahrenheit. So, so that's the second point you want to take home is that first we want to get that sunlight into our eyes within an hour of waking up, or if you're waking up before the sun rises, turn on bright lights, 
and then get those five to 10 minutes of, of indirect sunlight as soon as the sun is up. Okay, and you wanna do that when the sun is at the low angle in the sky. So again, let's say by 9, p 9 a.m. Okay, so let's go back to the cortisol boost because I wanna talk a little bit more about the angle of the sun. So that light, specifically sunlight, is going to ensure that that cortisol boost happens shortly after you awaken. Exercise also boosts your body temperature and therefore wakes you up. So waking up and maybe either exercising or exercising outside when the sun is rising or at a still at a low angle in the sky is gonna be phenomenal for resetting your biological clock, regulating your hormones and making sure you're ready for bed or sleepy at the reasonable time. So if you're sleeping in, or like I like to do on the weekends, right? I kind of, I stay inside a little bit. I lie around, you know, um, maybe you're lying around and texting in bed, staying inside, doing some work on your, you know, on your computer screen inside. Um, you're not getting enough light to trigger that cortisol boost. The light coming in through the windows isn't enough. The light coming from your devices isn't enough. And maybe you go outside, but not until like, let's say noon, because you want to go run some errands. And the experts will say that at this point, you're in the circadian dead zone. It's a lovely term, the circadian dead zone. It's like, it's too late. So first you haven't received enough light from, again, your devices through your windows in your house or from the artificial lights inside your house to trigger that cortisol boost. And then the type of light entering your eyes even from the sun at this point, let's say you don't get out there till noon, it's not going to trigger that cortisol pulse until the afternoon. So that means you'll be awake and alert into the night. So if you get your first sunlight exposure, let's say again at noon, and you get your cortisol pulse around like one or two in the afternoon, your body temperature is not going to peak until sometime in the late evening, like 10, 11 o'clock at night. And so you're going to be going. And then your body temperature is not going to drop to the point that you, it triggers sleep until like three or 4 AM, right? 16 hours later. So you really want to try to get that sunlight before 9 AM or as the sun rises five, 10 minutes, no sunglasses to trigger that cortisol pulse. And the type of the reason why we keep saying, or I keep saying that the sun needs to be at that lower angle is because you need something called yellow blue light contrast, yellow blue light contrast. And that happens at sunrise when the sun is at that lower angle in the sky, it's not happening when the sun is right overhead. So again, got to get out in the morning. Um, and the interesting fact around this later temperature shift or temperature rise. So let's say, right, you're doing all those things that I said not to do, like staying inside, relying on your devices for the light or, or sunlight through the windows. Um, and then you're not getting outside, actually outside to get sun exposure until the middle of the day, your temperature rhythms have shifted now, right? I just talked about that, right? Your body temperature doesn't peak until late at night. And then it doesn't start going down until the wee hours of the morning. And you're wondering why you're not sleepy at the normal time, even though maybe you got up early. Um, those temperature rhythms, when they shift to later in the day, those are signatures of difficulty falling asleep and also anxiety and depression. So this temperature um, rhythm, getting into it earlier in the day helps everything from our sleep quality to our mood to our chronic, even mood disorders. So this is a really, really important thing. And it, and feasibly it's, I mean, it's kind of, it's pretty simple, it's just five or 10 minutes outside sometime before 9.00 AM without your sunglasses on. Okay. And then maybe you're asking, and maybe I've already answered the question. What about your drive to work? You know, can you get some sunlight through the car windows? No, the car windows, windshields, your windows, they have UV protective coating and they also filter um, UV light through them. So it just doesn't get the job done in the same way. You need indirect unfiltered rays of the sun without protection, without sunglasses for five to 10 minutes, even when it's cloudy. And this is an interesting thing too. It triggers that sunlight actually triggers cells in your eyes to send signals to your hypothalamus, that hormone control center of your brain 
to release hormones that tell you to release melatonin. And melatonin is the sleepy hormone, right? It makes you sleepy. St how many hours later? 16 hours later. Okay. So it's such an interesting process to me that the, the body is so smart. It's, it has regulated itself in accordance with nature and around the sun, right? Which our whole, I guess, um, planet has evolved around. And so if you're not getting that sunlight until later in the day, you're just not going to get sleepy until very late in the evening. Or let's say you're super stressed on top of all that. Your cortisol levels maybe are too high then you might not fall asleep until you're completely physically exhausted. And then you'll end up waking up at what, three in the morning, two in the morning, sometime around there. And you can't go back to sleep because your mind is still on hyperdrive right? your body was exhausted. So you fell asleep, but your mind is still stressed out. It's still running, um, you know, at hundred miles an hour. And so it wakes you up. Your nervous system is still keyed up. And that, so here's a third point that when you wake up in the middle of the night or your mind is so revved up that your nervous system won't let you sleep, that's when you need to do one of two things. And you kind of have to decide what works for you. One thing that I find helps people kind of break this cycle is you need to get out of bed. So you don't associate lying awake with being in bed. You want to associate your bed with sleep. Right. So you're going to create a physical, um, a physical connection between tossing and turning or insomnia and your bed. And you don't want that. So get out of bed and you want to go read a physical book. And if you can read it by candlelight, right? Don't expose yourself to those bright lights because that will raise your body temperature and wake you up. Right. We just learned that. So that might be problematic, but at least it will get you out of bed and you won't associate tossing and turning and being stressed out in your mind going at hundred miles an hour with lying in bed. Better yet, stay in bed and turn on a yoga nidra recording. That's going to help you relax the nervous system, the mind and the body. So you're in a restful state and it gets your body temperature back down to where it's supposed to be so you can fall back asleep, right? Until your alarm goes off, until it's time to wake up. And yoga nidra is so helpful because it teaches us how to down regulate our nervous system in real time while we're awake, right? So we're learning a skill. We're learning how to relax the body and the nervous system while we're conscious. It resets our neural pathways. And if you're a yogi, it, it resets your samskaras those grooves, those patterns of being that you came into this world with. So it's a really, really powerful tool. Um, and you don't have to get out of bed. You don't have to expose yourself to light. You can relax. And then you are creating an association between relaxation, calm, body temperature coming down, down-regulating the nervous system with your bed. And that's what we want. So it's a super helpful practice. And I send you guys a new 20 minute yoga nidra recording every month. So feel free to use those, but there are some great ones on YouTube. Um, and let me put in the chat box here. I think if you Google um, NSDR non sleep down, like it's non, non sleep down regulation, I think it's NSDR yoga nidra. You'll get some really great recordings. I think they're even like 20 minutes, like mine are. Um, so Google that and see what you find. Let me see. Let me Google it for you and make sure that's right. Yeah. An SDR non-sleep deep rest, non-sleep deep rest. I got the acronym wrong. Okay, good. So that's another tip as far as when you wake up in the middle of the night with that insomnia, right? So you're able to go to sleep, but then you wake up and can't go back to sleep. So little trick there, yoga nidra or get out of bed and try to read by candlelight. If you can, don't expose yourself to, to too much bright light. So another benefit of this five or 10 minute morning practice, right, getting the sun exposure every day or most days of the week also allows for the production of dopamine. And it's a great hormone. It's actually not, not really the pleasure hormone. It actually motivates you to seek out 
pleasure. It drives you and inspires you to seek out new endeavors, new creative pursuits, right? New work projects, new goals, things that you don't already have, but want or desire in life, right? So without dopamine, we wouldn't work toward our goals. So the light exposure and that cortisol boost that creates dopamine and also 16 hours later creates melatonin is not only important for proper sleep, but it's also really good for the productivity throughout your day. Like we talked about, right? You wake up and we actually manufacture adrenaline. That's our source of, of readiness to go and create from dopamine. So we need all of these things to do our jobs for productivity, for focus, our satisfaction from life, our contentment to build ojas, right? From an Ayurvedic perspective, to build your immune system, to build your ability to withstand stress, getting that sunlight within an hour of waking when the sun is at a low angle in the sky, just five or 10 minutes, it does all these things. So, you know, it's a cure for sleeplessness. It's a cure for insomnia. It can be a cure for depression and anxiety, right? Or just lack of enthusiasm, lack of motivation, right? Lethargy. So it's a really, what I think is a, a very easy practice and it's, it's only five or 10 minutes of your time, but man, it's powerful. I had no idea that it did all of these things until I started doing research again with, um, our, in our chat box here, Andrew Huberman. Oh, I didn't put in that NSDR yoga meter. There it is. So fascinating things here. And so the sun exposure in the morning, right? is kind of everything. <laughs> it's really, really important. So let's talk too about what happens later in the day. Late in the day or the evening, your retinal sensitivity, the sensitivity of your retinas, the part of the eye that takes in light goes up they become more sensitive to light so, so that we can see when it gets dark, right? So if you're looking at bright lights and screens all night, especially those bright lights, okay? Screens, apparently, they've been given a really bad reputation and they're not that stimulating, okay? So you don't have to freak out too much about your screen time. It's, it can be stimulating, but bright lights or artificial lights are actually more stimulating. So you could be waking yourself back up in the evening if you're surrounded by bright lights. And this increases, right, your body temperature, and then it interferes with the natural process of your body temperature dropping. It's supposed to be dropping in the evening to make you sleepy. So you wanna start dimming your lights. And it might be kind of extravagant. It might sound silly, but if you can use candlelight, it's kind of fun. I love to read in the bath by candlelight. Um, and I was thinking, man, one candle is probably not going to do the trick, but it does. <laughs> so you just need one candle and kind of put it on the ledge right here. So it illuminates the book in front of you. It's really lovely. It's a really nice wind down practice. Um, and speaking of baths, a warm bath or a warm shower can actually facilitate that sleepiness as well, because when you apply warmth to the body, what's it going to try to do? It's going to try to cool off. So the trick is you just want to do a short warm bath or a, um, on the shorter side, warm, um, so sorry, shorter, warm shower, not hot. And then on the shorter side, warm bath again, not hot. So you might like it really, really hot, but what that does, it warms your core up. It warms, it sort of like warms you to the core or it heats you up to the core. And that's not what we want. That's, that's going to wake you up. So just a little warmth externally. So shorter shower, not, not very hot bath, just warm. Don't stay in there too long. You don't want to sweat basically. Okay. So you don't want to start sweating. If you're starting to sweat in your bath, it's too hot. So that's a good gauge, I think. And so the body then will try to cool down and that's going to induce the sleepiness factor. Okay. So can a cold shower warm you up in the morning? Yes. Interesting, right? I'm so we're trying to warm up the body in the morning to wake you up, right? The sunlight comes in, the cortisol bumps up, the body temperature rises and you wake up. 
So if we're applying a little bit of cold, what's the body going to try and do? Warm itself back up. So exercise can warm us up, but a, a short, very short, cold shower can also warm us up. And there's so much, I'll let you do research on your own here. Um, there's a lot out there about ice baths and cold showers. Um, and uh, Wim Hof, I'll type him in the chat here. You might Google Wim Hof if you're interested in his um, research and studies around breathing techniques and uh, cold water, um, ice cold water. <laughs> um, there's, there's so much out there. So you can research that, but make that cold shower short in the morning. And if you're like me, um, I, I kind of do it Swedish style. So you just lower the temperature of your shower at the end of the shower to gradually make it kind of cold and then stay there for a few seconds and then turn it off and you're done. So it's like just enough to wake you up because then the body tries to warm itself back up, body temperature raises, you wake up. Okay, let's talk about coffee. Let's talk about caffeine in the morning. This is fascinating to me. I love this. This whole talk is just, I love it. So I hope you're enjoying it too. So I encourage you to wait 90 minutes before you consume your first cup of coffee or caffeine. And here's why. There is a hormone called adenosine. Adenosine, I'll type it in the, you may not have heard of this one. I'll type it in the chat, adenosine. And adenosine is what makes us sleepy. It assists with our digestion. It lowers blood pressure. It dilates blood vessels, among many other things. And the longer we're awake, the more adenosine we create, the more adenosine builds up. And that makes sense because the longer we're awake, the closer we are to needing sleep, right? The closer we get to bedtime. And adenosine is cleared by sleep. Okay, so we start to, we clear out the, the, the adenosine while we're sleeping. Now we still have some adenosine the first 60 to 90 minutes after waking up, kind of in those like, oh, I'm kind of half asleep, half awake. I'm not sure if I actually want to get up, but here I go. That groggy, you know, first part of the morning after we wake up. Also, if we don't sleep very well, we have more adenosine um, that hasn't been flushed out of the system when we wake up from a bad night's sleep or not enough sleep. Exercise also helps clear adenosine. So that's why movement first thing in the morning, preferably outside and after the sun has risen and it's at that low angle is also so beneficial. Okay. So you want to clear the adenosine from your system because before you have your caffeine, because caffeine inhibits adenosine. It prevents it from binding to its receptors. So if you haven't cleared out all that adenosine and then you drink coffee or have caffeine, that leftover adenosine stays in your system all day. It can't bind to its receptors. The caffeine is blocking it. Your body can't use it up. So, and I don't know if you know this, but caffeine has like a half-life of, um, for some people like six to eight hours. So half of the caffeine you consumed in the morning is still in your system six to eight hours later. So when the caffeine starts to wear off and drop around what, like usually in the afternoon, like two o'clock, three o'clock, your adenosine can finally bind. And now it's going to do it with a vengeance even more strongly to those receptors. And you get the afternoon crash because adenosine makes us sleepy. So I encourage you to wait at least 90 minutes. They say 60 to 90 minutes. I say 90 to be safe. Cause you don't, if you really are suffering from an afternoon crash and are experiencing a lot of brain fog, then go with the 90 minutes, right? So wait 90 minutes to be safe before you drink your coffee. And preferably after you've had that five or 10 minutes of sunlight outdoors and some movement to make sure you've again, cleared that adenosine and you don't have that afternoon crash because of something you could have prevented in the morning just by waiting. Um, another, uh, many other studies that I've read, another little tidbit is that your cortisol levels, because you're, you're getting that natural sunlight, you're waking up, your body temperature is rising in the morning, especially if you're in that rhythm, your cortisol levels rise so much in the morning 
because of this phenomenon we're talking about in our circadian rhythms that you don't really need the caffeine right away, right? So if you're in this rhythm, if you're getting that natural light, if you're moving, um, waking with the sun, you know, doing these things, then you really, the, the caffeine, um, it's probably not what you need or what you want. You really want the warm drink. You want the ritual. So if you're waiting 90 minutes to have your caffeine, have a warm drink instead that's caffeine free. You might not even want your coffee 90 minutes later. And if you do, that's fine. Have it. But you might not, right? You might find that what you really wanted was the warm drink because you didn't really need it. Okay. So to recap, we want to rise with the sun. We want to get outside within an hour of rising for just five to 10 minutes when the sun is still low in the sky. Or if you're waking up before the sun rises, turn on those bright lights and then get your five or 10 minutes as soon as the sun is up. Okay, and you wanna do that without sunglasses. Please do not stare directly at the sun. I don't know, that's not what we're saying. The indirect light is gonna to come to your eyes even when it's cloudy. Okay, so even when it's cloudy, you're still getting benefits. And then you wanna exercise or move within 90 minutes of waking to help continue to enhance your body temperature and wake you up. And to also encourage that 16 hours later uh, drop in the body temperature to make you sleepy, right? So get yourself going in the morning to ensure that you come back down at the right time in the evening. And then you wanna wait to drink your coffee or your caffeine until 90 minutes after waking. And you might consider just a short little cold shower or switch to cold water at the end of your shower in the morning, if you bathe in the morning. Um, dim your lights at night and li limit your screen time. Read physical books before bed if you can versus a Kindle or a device. Try 20 minutes of yoga nidra most days of the week to train your body to downregulate in real time to calm your nervous system. And use that yoga nidra when you have insomnia, when you wake up in the middle of the night and can't sleep or get out of bed and go read until you're sleepy again, right? We want to, we don't want to associate our bed with tossing and turning, worrying and fretting, our mind circulating, right? That insomnia. So get out of bed or downregulate your nervous system in bed using yoga nidra. Um, you might take a short warm shower or just a 10, 15 minute warm, not hot bath about an hour before bed to encourage the body to keep cooling down and then experiment with play with the temperature in your sleeping quarters, your bedroom, um, aiming for 60 to 67 degrees Fahrenheit. You might find 67 is just right, right? 60 degrees is pretty, pretty freaking cold. So um, it might be that, you know, 67 is the sweet spot, but remember you release heat from your palms and your feet. So pile yourself up with blankets if you're really cold natured, but get that room down and then your hands and feet can come out of the covers if they need to release that heat. And I, I know it's not going to be really fun at first if you're not a morning person, but if you really commit to this and get up and do these things, and remember, it's just five or 10 minutes of sun exposure in the morning that you'll start a habit that really pays off in better sleep, improved hormone production, all the important ones, increased productivity, enhanced drive. They found that everything from, you know, your work motivation to even your sex drive increases when you are exposed to sunlight on a regular basis, your skin is actually an endocrine organ. So it affects your endocrine system and your hormones and your adrenals. It, so getting this five or 10 minutes within an hour of waking, when the sun is low, you get more enjoyment out of your day, out of your life and a decreased risk of every disease out there, every disease out there. So try to commit maybe just one week of waking up early and getting outside for five to 10 minutes within an hour of waking before your coffee. And you're probably going to have some crashes in the afternoon because <laughs> if you're, because your rhythms aren't there yet. Right. So if you're still going to bed late, and you're getting up early anyway, which I think is a good idea to get into this habit. You kind of have to kind of have to make some sacrifices if you want to get into this rhythm. Um, you're not going to be getting quite enough sleep yet, but I think after a week, you absolutely will catch up and balance out. I really believe this will pay off. So um, I am going to, to try to work on that 
this week myself um, because I really want those benefits. I really want that hormone regulation and I want that enhanced drive. And, and just anecdotally, you know, I've seen what um, my energy levels are like when I take a walk outside in the morning versus when I don't. And so I've, I've witnessed firsthand and you probably have to, you know, how differently you feel when you get outside and you move, um, right when you wake up and it's, it's early enough, you know, so that you get that, that timed response 16 hours later that tells you, Hey, guess what? It's time to go to sleep now. And you're going to be sleepy. That's the the best feeling in the world. So I'm going to try to do that this week. And I'm going to use our, our Facebook group as my accountability, um, accountability group. If you guys want to join me, I welcome you to, and I'm going to, I guess I'm going to pause or stop the recording. And then if you guys have any questions, feel free to jump in. So I'm going to stop the recording. Thank you everybody for watching. And if you have questions and weren't able to attend live, please feel free to use our Facebook group for that. Thank you again. All right. Fun topic.